we are live and we welcome you to the Bird Street Church of Christ worship service. So glad to have you all with us this morning. So thankful that the Lord has blessed us to get up and dress these our bodies to come out to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We'd like to welcome all our visitors, both who are here in person, on the conference call, and on who are on Facebook Live as well. If you would, would you stand with me as we recite our mission statement? Our mission statement reads, We the family of God's people at 428 Bird Street are passionate in worship, compassionate in service, aggressive in witness, strong in fellowship, and committed to discipleship. Amen, amen. Our call to collective worship comes from Psalm 27, verses 4 and 5, and it reads, one thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle, shall he hide me. He shall 
26 to 27, and it reads like this. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, and believed not he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, took him and brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to them.
see those who have uh, come out to be with us in person. As Brother Well said, we appreciate those that have joined us on Facebook uh, live this morning. It's good to have you. And those that may be on our conference call, I hope you still on uh, with us this morning. We are in the series of Summoning Your Courage. And today I want to look at, in this series, be a bottle. Be a bond. Now, when you think about summoning up your courage, we're actually talking about uh, you need to decide that you want to step up to the plate. You want to have to make a decision to do, as Brother Wall said, what you know you ought to be doing. So this morning I want to look at another guy by the name of Barnabas. Now, if you have been with us through this series, you know we have talked about the guy Jehoiada. Yes. Y'all remember him? Yes. Uh, this was the guy that was the priest that was in the temple uh, that decided that he would take uh, Joaz, the little seven-year-old boy, and put him on the throne. Yes. Uh, he summoned up his courage yes. uh, to do this. Uh, even though it wasn't popular. But before we get to Jordan, that was his wife. Yeah. Her name was Jehora Shebeth, yeah. yeah. and she was the one that actually yeah. hid uh, Josiah, you know, so that uh, Athiah, the mother or the grandmother, would not kill him. Mm -hmm. Now, you remember the story? We kind of talked about that, yeah. how Isaiah, which was the king, had sons, and the son was next in lineage to be on the throne. But the mother, Athiah, yeah. decided that she was going to kill all of the children, mm -hmm. but she missed one. Yeah. Now, it's a hard woman to kill your own grandchildren, but she wanted the throne so bad that she killed her own grandchildren. But she missed one. That was Joash. And this woman, Jehoradah, wife of Jehorashebeth, found it and hid him. So then we talk about David. Remember, we said David had to sum up his courage. He had to strengthen himself simply because when David and his men had went off the battle and they came back home, they found that the city of Zigzag had been burned yes, and they also found that the Amalekites had taken all of their wives and their children and their belongings and they had left. And when David and his men got back to Zigzag, the Bible says that they cried so much, yes. they weeped so much that there was no more tears left in them. And they decided that they're going to stone David. Because they said, this is your fault that our wives and our children are gone. So David had to sum up his courage. And you remember last week we talked about Joseph of Arimathea. We talked about how Joseph, that rich man, was one that wanted to take the body of Jesus. He took the body off the cross. He summoned up his courage to go to Pilate and ask him uh, for the body. And then we talked about Nicodemus. Yes, sir. Now, Nicodemus, the guy that went to Jesus by night, he had to summon up his courage because he was a wealthy individual uh, as well. And he brought all of these spices. The Bible says he brought about a hundred pounds of spices to to anoint the body of Jesus. So this morning, I want to spend the remainder of our time talking about Barnabas. Talking about Barnabas. There's a lot we may not know about Barnabas. Matter of fact, Barnabas was really not his name. Yes, sir. Did I know that? Yes, sir. Barnabas was his nickname. You know how you all give folk nicknames. names? You don't know folk real names. Amen. You know, I have people all the time say, you heard about so-and-so, so-and-so past, and you think, I don't know. Because we often call them a nickname, you know, name like Bubba. You know, that ain't nobody's real name, I don't guess. Oh, uh, word, you know. My son yesterday said, well, Dad, you ain't got to worry about picking up the kids, because 
worm gonna bring them home? Who in the world is worm? Who had named their child worm? The turtle, you know, we, we call some folk turtle. Or we call them peanut, you know, or chipmunk. You know, all these nicknames we call people. And a person can die, and you can hear that real name, and you are saying, I don't know that person. I ain't never heard of that person. But if you give them the nickname, then you say, oh, yeah, that's who you talking about. Sometimes nicknames can create problems. We talked about a guy this morning with a nickname. His nickname is Bonnie's. Now, I want to look and find out what his real name is. And then we're going to talk about this guy named Bonnie's. Now, in the book of Acts, chapter 4, if you take a note, Acts chapter 4, verse number 36 and 37, the Bible says, and Josie, now, King James used the word Josie with J-O-S-E-S. Most versions use the word Joseph, okay? Joseph, Joseph was his real name. And Joseph, whom the apostles, when they surnamed Barnabas, they gave him a, a nickname, Barnabas. Why did they give him this name? They gave him the name Barnabas because the name Barnabas simply means encourager yes, or the son of consolation. When you think of the word bar, bar, uh, in the Hebrew, actually means the son of Bar. You remember that was Bar Jesus with Simon in Acts 13. Uh, there was another uh, name by Bar Jonah uh, in Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus called him Simon's Bar Bar Jonah. Bar just simply means the son of. Here you have Bar Rabbit. Which literally means the son of encouragement or the son that is an encourager. Yes. So here's what we're going to learn about this guy, Barnabas. We're going to find out that he's a Levite. Not only is he a Levite, but he is from the country of Cyprus. The Bible says he had land sold it and brought it, all the money, and laid it down at the apostles' feet. Now, now you got to follow this guy because if he's a Levite, okay. and if you know anything about Levite, they was not allowed to have property. Right. You go back in the Old Testament, those from the tribe of Levi was always dependent upon the money treasury uh, from the people. They were not allowed to own property and have property. Why? Because the people supported them. They was Levi. Now, why is it that Barnabas had land that he sold and brought the money to the apostles' feet? Possibly that his wife may have owned the property. Possibly. Possibly things may have changed. Because when I read the book of Jeremiah, I also find out that Jeremiah was a Levite, but he also had property uh, as well. So how this guy came about property, we don't know. All we know is, is that he had it yes, and he sold it. Yes, and he sold it and brought the money and laid it down at the apostles' feet. Yes, That's what we know about this guy by the name of, of Barnabas. But who was the Joseph? What Joseph that we're going to talk about? Now, is this the Joseph that was the that was uh, Mary? Uh, had the many coats of many colors? Is that the Joseph that we are talking about? Is it the Joseph that was the husband of Mary? The father of Jesus, earthly father. Is that the Joseph that we are talking about? Is it the Joseph of Arimathea, the one that took the body of the cross uh, 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 and laid it in his new tomb? Is that the Joseph that we 
y'all talking about. No, no, no. And neither one of these, the Joseph, that we're going to look at this morning. Because when we look at this Joseph, we're going to find some things out about him that you may not have never considered. Now, when you flip over to Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse number 26 and verse number 27, the Bible said, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he afraid to join himself to uh, the disciples. Now, let's stop right there. Here is Saul. Actually, his name is Paul by now. But he had went off. He had seen the Lord on the Damascus Road, you remember, earlier. And he had met the Lord. But he was changed. And his life had changed. When he met the Lord on the Damascus Road, God sent him to Arabia. Yeah. He went into Arabia and he preached there for three years. Now, see this picture. When he left, he was Saul, the persecutor of Christians. When he left, he was the one that was on his way to Damascus to take Christian and bind them, put them in jail or prison, or even beat them. The disciples knew this about this guy. Everybody was afraid of Saul. Three years later, Saul decides that he's going to come back to Jerusalem. But when he comes back to Jerusalem, the Bible says that the apostles were afraid of him. Now, you have to think, why would they be afraid? What were they afraid of? I mean, if the guy said he was a Christian and he had been preaching for the last three years, what are you guys afraid of? Why don't you just welcome him with open arms? No, no, ain't that simple. Because see, what they thinking is, all we can remember yeah. is what you used to do. Did you see some folk like that in your life? Yeah. I don't care how much you have changed over the last five years, the last 20 years, there's going to always be somebody that's not going to remember the last 20 years of your life. They're going to go back before that and they remember when. That's how the apostles was remembering Saul. They remembered when you left him, you was a persecutor. Now, we don't know where you've been. We don't know what you've been doing. We don't know whether or not you have been off killing Christians for the last three years or not. We are not going to give you the right hand of fellowship. That's where they are. Now, Paul wanted that right hand. He wanted the fellowship with them. He wanted them to understand that he was one of them now. But the apostle just couldn't see it. But here's what happened. But they were afraid of him. And they believed that he was not a disciple because of how he used to be. What he used to do. They were afraid of him. But Verse 27 says, but Barnabas took him. Now, now you're going to always need somebody that's going to stand in your corner. Uh, yes, you want to need somebody that's going to believe in you. Here you have Barnabas yes. who decided to summon his character because he wanted the apostles to know that the 
the story that when he was persecuted, Christians, they only knew half of his story. So what Barnabas did, Barnabas took Paul, set him in the midst of the apostles, and he said, let me tell you about this guy now. And he began to tell them how he had met the Lord in the way. He told them how he had seen the Lord in the, the way. He told them how he had left and been preaching and been learning himself for the last three and a half years. What Barnabas did for Paul was that he told the apostle, this guy is one of us. Y'all ain't got to be afraid of him. He's part of the family now. But it's hard for some of us to really grasp the idea that some people can change. We can baptize a person this morning that you've been doing all your life that been doing this, have been doing that. We'll baptize them and they'll say, I have changed, I have given my life to the Lord. Some of us still gonna be skeptical. Some of us still gonna wonder, what is his alternative motive? Why is he really here? No, 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 Paul have bottoms. You need a bottomless in your life. I need a bottomless in my life. All of us need somebody that's going to encourage us along the way. Because all of us have situations. All of us have problems. All of us go through some things. We have enough critics in the world. We need some encouragers. Somebody to go step up to the plate and say, he's all right. She's all right. They're okay. I need that. You need that. So he explained to them. Then they he said that they had spoken unto him how he had preached boldly at Democritus in the name of, of Jesus Christ. What did he do? Paul said, all y'all remember is when he left Jerusalem. Y'all don't remember what happened on the way to Damascus. Oh, we heard the apostles say. We heard that. That, that he met the Lord on the way. We heard the story how he was struck blind and knocked down off the horse. We heard that there was a guy by the name of Ananias that had to go down and preach to him and tell him about Jesus. We heard that he even obeyed and he was robed and was baptized. We heard all of that. But we ain't seen no more of the guy. Seemed like he just dropped off of the radar. So here's what Barnabas does. Barnabas says, you know, when he got to Damascus, he preached Christ. And he was not timid in his preaching. He said he preached boldly at Damascus. So here, Barnabas is standing up for Paul. But when you look at Acts 13, in Acts chapter 13, it says, There in the church was certain Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas. Here's something else I learned about this guy, Barnabas. I learned that this guy, Barnabas, was a prophet. He was a teacher. And we're going to find out he was a preacher. There's a lot we can learn about this guy named Barnabas, the encourager. But then you get over to chapter 15. And chapter 15 is a very interesting chapter to help all of us understand a lot about this guy Barnabas. Because see, Barnabas had to have been made a little older fellow. Barnabas was seasoned in the word. Barnabas was one of those guys that you could go to and talk to and share with it and you didn't have to worry about it getting all over time. Because there's some folks you just can't tell everything. Because next thing you know it's all over Facebook. It's all over the internet. It's everywhere. Barnabas had to have been one of those guys that you could trust. Because
because when they had the problem with between the Jews and the Gentiles down in Antioch, they had to send back to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles. And when they went back to meet with the apostles, they had an issue because the Jews was trying to tell the folk, the Gentiles, that if you want to be Christian, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to keep the certain days, you've got to do this, you got to do that. They had all of these laws, and so they had to send back to the apostles in Jerusalem about this issue. And you don't know who went? Paul and Barnabas. Why? Because Barnabas was one of those that you could depend on. Barnabas was one of those that was an encourager. That's why the apostle gave him that name. They gave him the name Barnabas because he was an encourager. He would always encourage the folk. So when you get over into Acts chapter 15, you find out that this guy, Barnabas, was such an encourager. He loved what he was doing. But he was also one that would step up to the plate and encourage other folk. He encouraged the church at Antioch. My fact, the work got so so big for him uh, in Antioch that he needed some help. Y'all know who he went and got? He went and got Paul. Why did he go get Paul? Because when the disciples heard that Paul was one of them, when Ananias brought, then when Barnabas brought him back to them, word got out that y'all oh, know we ain't gonna believe that this guy Paul is who he said he is. And the people start to riot, and they wanted to kill Paul. So they had to put him in a basket, let him down the wall, and the apostle sent him home. They said, you need to go back to Tarsus. Where are you from? And they sent the preacher, Paul, back home. Now he goes all the way back to Tarsus. He was in Tarsus about two years or a little more. Now what was he doing there? I'm assuming. Maybe he preached, or maybe he just decided that the work was so great that he just went home and sat down. I, I don't know. But this is what I do know. When the work got so big for Barnabas and Antioch, he needed some help. Guess where he went? He went all the way from Antioch to Tarsus to find and look for Paul. And he said, Paul, we need you. We need you in Antioch. You've been in Tarsus too long. It's time for you to get up and come to Antioch so and help me with the work that all of us need a Barnabas. Y'all heard me tell the story before. The reason why I'm here at Bird Street is because I had a Barnabas. The reason why I'm right standing here right now today, because there was a time I went home like Paul. I went home and sat out, didn't preach nowhere. And there was a Barnabas by the name of Killer Fleming Sr. They called me and said, Anthony, you've been sitting too long. I need you to come to Bird Street and preach. He was my Barnabas. And still, my Barnabas. If you were to ask him today, he would probably tell you, I'm his Barnabas. Because we go up and spend some time and talk with him and encourage him. Because he was struggling with some issues. He needed a Barnabas. Most preachers don't have a Barnabas. Someone that will encourage you. Someone that will will help you, that you can depend on. Somebody will say, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. All of us need somebody to encourage us. So Barnabas was Paul's encourager. But not only did Barnabas summon up his courage to go to the apostles and defend Paul, there came a time when Barnabas and Paul had a disagreement. You read this in Acts 15. That's right. That's right. There was a time when the work was going well. You had Paul and Barnabas. You had John Mark on the 
first missionary journey. And they were preaching the gospel, establishing the churches all over the place. They were planting the church here and planting the church there. And they got ready to go to Pamphylia. And when they got ready to go to Pamphylia to preach the gospel and plant a church, John Mark decides, I'm tired. I ain't going to the work no more. And the Bible says that John Mark decided that he was going to leave and go back home. Now, I don't know why he left. Maybe he got homesick. I don't know. Maybe he got sick with some kind of physical ailment. I don't know why John Mark left. All the Bible says he is, is that he returned home. So now he's left with Barnabas and Paul. They continued to preach the gospel without John Mark. But the day came when they decided that they want to go back and visit all the churches that they had planted just to see how they was doing. Yes, they wanted to see not only that they was planted, but they are also maturing. Yes, yes. So they decided we want to go back and visit all of these churches. So here's the problem. The problem is, Barnabas said, great idea, Paul. Let's go back. I'm going to get my cousin, John Mark. And you do know John Mark was the cousin of Paul, but of Barnabas. He said, I'm going to go back and get John Mark, and I'm going to take him with us. You know what Paul said? Paul said, nah, -uh. no way. He ain't going with us. And Barnabas said, so why come he can't go? Paul, Paul said, no, he's not going with us. Why? Because he left us the first time. Yes, sir. And we ain't taking him on this second missionary journey. He ain't going with me. <laughs> yes, Barnabas said, okay, Paul. Yes, sir. If that's the way you feel about it, yes, if that's how you want to handle it, the Bible said that they got in such a heated argument. They became so heated in this argument. And we talk about two leaders. We talk about two leaders here. Barnabas and Paul, who had been working fine together. But now they decide they can't go the same way no more. They had a disagreement. Now let me ask you, which one was right and which one was wrong? Could they be possible both of them could have been right? Or is it possible that both of them could have been wrong? Who was right in this argument? Was Paul right by not taking it because he left him the first time? Or was Barnabas, his cousin, right by saying, Paul, the guy that matured a little bit now, I think he's ready to go with us. Paul kept saying, no. No, he is not going. Now you would have thought that Barnabas would have said, okay, Paul, if that's the way you want it, that's the way it'll be. But here's what you find out. Barnabas summoned up his courage. He summoned his courage to stand before Paul and say, Paul, I don't care. How do you feel about John Mark? He's going. And it got so heated that they decided to split up. They separated from themselves. Paul took Silas and went one way. Barnabas took John Mark and went another way. Now here's the thing. Here's the thing. Both of them Continue to preach the gospel. If you look at it, they covered technically twice as much ground now than they would have if they'd all been together. I believe God used that. God used that situation to spread the gospel more. Now don't leave her thinking that Paul and Barnabas became intimate. But they didn't become no enemies. And don't leave you thinking that Paul had a problem with John Mark and they never want to have anything to do with him. That ain't true. Because when you get, Paul gets to the end of his life. In 2 Timothy chapter 4. Yes, sir. He 
He says, bring Bring job on. He's useful to me in the ministry. Somewhere along the line, Paul had a different heart about John Moore. Maybe Paul realized just how useful this young guy really was. Maybe he had heard or seen what he had done with his cousin Barnabas. I don't know. But I do know this. Paul forgave the guy whatever the issue was, and they came back together. You see, when you understand that you can be different and you can agree to disagree, you don't have to take things to your grave. You can get them, but forgive the person. And let's, and let's move forward. Let's go on. Paul didn't let that hinder him simply because of that. So he declined all the miracles and wonders that he had done among the Gentiles and them. So what is it then that we have learned thus far from Joseph that we call Barnabas? The first thing we learned is that he was a Jew. Not only was he a Jew, but he was a Levite. Not only was he a Levite, he was a prophet. Not only was he a prophet, but he was a preacher. Not only was he a preacher, but he was a cousin to John Mark. Barnabas, the encourager. Here's what I want us to look at this morning. Who? Who is your Barnabas? Who is your Barnabas? Do you have a Barnabas in your life? Is there a person that you can depend on that you know that's going to be there for you? Whatever you have done, they ain't going to look down on you and they're not going to push you down. They're going to lift you up. Someone said the only time you're going to be looking down on a person is when you're reaching down to pull them up. See, who, who in your life that pulls you? and not stomp on you when you are down. Someone said that, that we as Christians is the only organization that kills our own wounded. Catch a person down, we just keep stomping on them. No, we need to be encouragers. You need to be encouraging somebody. You need to be somebody's encourager. And my question to you is, when you go through stuff, and we all go through stuff, who encourages you? Who's your encourager? And if you sit in here this morning and you can't think of nobody that encourages you, let me tell you, you are headed for a downfall that's going to take you really down. You're going to need somebody in your life. And I don't know who that person may be. It may be your spouse, it may be your children, it may be your parents, it, it may be your classmate, it may be the person sitting on the seat next to you. I don't know who your encourager is, but you need an encourager. And you need to be an encourager. Find somebody that's going through something, and you encourage them. Let them know that it ain't going to always be like this. Oh, I understand the struggle that you're going through right now. But guess what? You ain't going to always struggle like this. Oh, I know you having family issues, but, but you don't have to always have family issues. I know you may be having financial problems, but you don't always have to have financial problems. I know you got this problem and that problem, but it don't always have to be. Your problem does not define you need somebody in your life that'll tell you that. And not somebody that oh, you, you made your bed hard. You like a lion. Y'all have heard that. I know that. My daddy taught me that when I was 16. I know that. But I don't need you. At 68, to still tell me that. I know it. But why didn't you learn? I need 
get you to encourage me. Sometimes we go through stuff that's not a fault of our own. It's not my fault that I'm in this situation. And there are some times that I find myself in situations that is really my fault. But I need an encouragement. I need somebody that's going to just encourage me. So let me ask you again. Who is your boss? Who is your boss? Who, 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 who encourages you when you get down? Who is yours? Someone says that encouragement is like oxygen to the human spirit. Don't forget, you are carrying someone else's air. Encourage them. Help them to breathe. Good word. Good word. Encouragement, it says, is like oxygen to the human spirit. Don't forget, you got somebody else's air. My question to you is this morning, whose air are you carrying? And I know you may be sitting there and saying, I'm just trying to breathe on my own. <laughs> I, I, I just try to keep my head above water. The Hebrew writer said, and carry one 
The chapter 5, verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as you are doing. Amen. Let us encourage one another. Amen. Encourage one another. You know somebody need encouraging? Encourage them. Don't put it off. Be a Barnabas. Be a Barnabas. Be an encourager. Be one of those individuals that people can depend on that you're going to encourage them. Now, as you leave here today, if there's somebody in your life that you know needs encouragement, go encourage them. If there's somebody that you need to talk to to build them up, do it today.
recognize Mr. Crenshaw if you would have a seat at the appropriate time, Brother Will, to make sure that he'll call on you. Again, I thank you guys this morning. Y'all have been such a patient audience as we talked about another individual that summoned up his courage. Lord's with it. And the creek don't rise. Next time we're going to talk about Queen Esther. We're going to tell the story of Queen Esther and how Queen Esther summoned her courage. May God bless you. Again, let the church say amen. amen. We are glad to have each of you with us this morning. We want to say welcome to any visitors that we may have in the audience or ones that have called in or online. We're glad to have you today. And again, to the members here, we're glad to see each of you this morning. We have a few announcements in our uh, weekly announcements that we share with you each week. Our first announcement, we do have a youth spotlight again uh, by the name of Natasha Chun. And the last week I highlighted, this week she celebrated senior night at Cascade. So she is about to graduate. So that is very good. The proud grandparents are Keith and Tanya Chun. So she is growing up on us, as they say. She's a senior about to come out. So uh, we want to say congratulations to her uh, on being recognized for senior night. Also, have another youth uh, scholarship announcement. And I have the form here if you are interested in more details. And this is the Captain Luther J. Hunter Jr. Uh, Memorial Foundation Scholarship. There are some requirements that if you are a young person and about to graduate, that I have information here in front of me that I will give to you. I did want to note that the deadline 
Uh, the application must be postmarked by May the 15th, 2022. And there's an address you need to send the applications to. Myself and Sister Crenshaw was on a youth uh, area council's call yesterday. This is one of the things that was brought up, and I wanted to be sure that the young folks here uh, are aware of this. And I'll be sure they know it as well. The parents, I want to make sure you, if you have anyone that is graduating, uh, to be aware of that. The, and this is also, I want you to know this. This is for male and female graduating high school seniors. And the, their theme is Save Our Children One by One. Save Our Children One by One. So again, if you want more information on this application, please let me know and I will be sure to pass that along uh, to you. Uh, another announcement, a uh, new announcement, is the Tennessee Youth Conference. As you all know, like many things, the pandemic over the last two to three years has really impacted how things are done and how we do things. Uh, this year, they are going to restart the Tennessee State Youth Conference. As you know, we have attended it here in years past, but there's a couple things I want the body here to be aware of. First is the date. The date for that is June the 10th through the 11th, and the West Tennessee congregations are hosting it uh, this year. Uh, a key difference is it is a hybrid. And you say, Jabari, what does hybrid mean? You may be familiar with a hybrid car, but a hybrid means it's, it's going to be in person or virtually. And so what they mean by that, uh, each congregation can bring their people together, in this case young folks, and watch it virtually uh, as they host it. Uh, they will be hosted, I said again, in West Tennessee, but it's primarily virtual this year due the, to the pandemic. Uh, the theme is going to be from chaos to secure hearts. From chaos to secure hearts. And I think we all can allude to the last two to three years has been a lot of chaos uh, in our world. And there's a registration fee for each congregation. Friday night will kick off with a live stream, followed by Zoom breakout classes and more on Saturday too. So again, to our young people, you are very familiar, I think, now with Zoom, because uh, you all have had to deal with all that this past year or two in school, in your schools. But again, uh, it's going to be hybrid, and I'll be giving you all more information as it before comes. This was kind of new news as of yesterday, and I want to be sure the body here uh, is aware of that information. Do not forget our weekly events that we have uh, Sunday throughout, starting today and throughout the week. On Tuesday, we have our devotion and prayer call. will be Brother Fred McGee from Center Hill will be our speaker uh, this coming Tuesday. Brother Booker will continue on Wednesday nights with our Bible study. And then on Tuesday and Thursday, don't not forget our sister's ministry and prayer call. Wednesday night dinner will be chapter 8. Last week, Brother Booker talked about the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And he dove into that. And so again, uh, that will be further study in chapter 8 this coming week. Um, community information, I've made known of this before about the free COVID testing kits. Go to the uh, website mentioned here, COVID. COVID rather, COVID, COVID, I'm saying COVID, COVID test, uh, dot gov. You may find that information available uh, to you. That's all the announcements that I have on um, this morning. One last announcement I meant to uh, provide, and I'll give it to Brother Randy when he comes. He can read this off uh, as well. So again, we appreciate all you being with us today. And at this time, Brother Green will give us our closing prayer.